Um, okay, I think the numbers of attendees um, have stabilized a little bit and we have a lot to get through today. Um, so we might as well kick off. So welcome everybody to the Housing Agency's uh, Talking About Land series. This is session seven, the last session in the series, and it's about inclusionary zoning. Um, so just a quick reminder that the other sessions are all available on the Housing Agency website. Um, and the slides from today and a recording of the session will be put up there as well. Um, so it's well worth, if, if maybe you're only joining us for the first time for this session, it's well worth watching back the others. Um, we've covered various topics and I've had speakers from all over Europe um, about on, this, on these issues. So for today's uh, webinar, uh, very happy to welcome um, John Watcher um, from the Greater London Authority and Danny McLaughlin, who's Chief Executive of South Dublin County Council. Um, for today, we hope to have a very interactive session with lots of time for questions at the end. Um, so if you could please use the Q&A function in Zoom for any questions that you have, um, you can pop them in as they occur to you and we'll get to them at the end. Um, my colleagues Tara and Sarah are on the call. Tara is available if anybody's having any technical difficulties. So we'd ask that if you are having technical difficulties that you use the chat to contact Tara and that you use the Q&A uh, for submitting questions, as I said. Um, so to introduce our two speakers, um, first up to speak is John Watcher, who's the Strategic Planning Manager in Viability with the Greater London Authority. Uh, so John leads the Mayor of London's Viability team and oversees strategic policy and guidance on viability and the assessment of strategic applications at the Greater London Authority. He's co-author of the London Plan and led on the Mayor's Affordable Housing and Viability Guidance. He's the Greater London Authority lead on the infrastructure levy proposals in levelling up regeneration bill and building safety levy. Um, John is an expert on affordable housing, developer contributions and viability in the planning system and has chaired the London Authority's viability group for the last eight years. Our second speaker is uh, Danny McLaughlin, who's the Chief Executive of South Dublin County Council. Uh, Danny has been in local government for 40 years, including um, 20 years is Chief Executives in uh, Leitrim, Westmead and currently South Dublin County Council, where he's been Chief Executive since 2013. Um, in addition to his role as Chief Executive, Danny is heavily involved in public policy at a national and regional level. He's been Chairman to the City and County Management Association, the Dublin Housing Supply Coordination Task Force, member of Dublin Tourism and the National Sports Leadership Group. And he's over 20 years experience in national leadership, local government, sectoral HR and strategic development, and sector strategy development. Um, so I'll hand over to uh, John to begin the first presentation. Uh, Tara, can I start sharing the slides? Um, yeah, so I'll hand over to yourself, John, if the slides are working correctly. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me uh, to take part in this very interesting series of talks. So I'm going to talk a bit about the experience of securing affordable housing through the planning system in London over the last 10 to 15 years, but with a particular focus on the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan's policies and how they've helped to increase affordable housing delivery over the last six or so years. Just a quick uh, overview of London government and how it relates to planning. We have 32 London boroughs. Uh, the City of London Corporation deals with the square mile, which is the area where we have most of our financial services in central London. We have two mayoral development corporations and all of those bodies have their own planning powers. They bring forward local plans which determine the, the approach to de development in their areas. And those plans are used to determine planning applications. I should say that we don't have a zonal system in the UK, we have a discretionary system. We nearly had a zonal system, which was proposed in the planning white paper in 2020, but that hasn't been taken forward. And in addition, the mayor has strategic powers, the mayor of London, uh, and he produces the London plan, which sets out the overall development strategy for London and is also used to determine planning applications because it forms part of the statutory development plan. And he also has plans to call in strategic planning applications uh, in which he becomes the local planning authority and can decide to grant planning permission or refuse planning permission. And he also has the power to direct local authorities to refuse planning permission as well. 
So just a couple of comments on the developer contribution system in England. Um, and I know that you've had a previous session on this and Professor Tony Crook gave a very good overview, so I won't dwell on this. Uh, but just briefly to say that the two main mechanisms that we have for securing contributions and, and other forms of commitments from developers are Section 106 agreements. Those, those were uh, put in place through the Town and Country Planning Act in 1990, and we used those to secure planning obligations, which range from affordable housing through to site specific mitigation measures, employment and training, carbon offsetting, affordable workspace, um, any obligation that's necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms, and those need to be in relation to implementing a policy in the plan or dealing with site specific issues that arise um, as part of the application process. And then secondly, we have the community infrastructure levy, which was introduced in the Planning Act in 2008. It really came on stream in about 2012. And most boroughs in London have their own community infrastructure levy, which is a fixed charge calculated on net additional floor space. And the Mayor of London also has a community infrastructure levy, which he uses to secure funding for the Elizabeth line. We also have a new system which is in the pipeline called the infrastructure levy, and that is proposed in the levelling up and regeneration bill, which is currently going through Parliament as in is in the, the House of Lords. So in terms of land value capture, the UK has had quite a chequered history. There were various measures introduced in the early post-war planning period, uh, none of them particularly successful. Uh, but now we do have a broad consensus that land value capture is a good thing, uh, but just some disagreement as to how best to do it. And a few years ago, there was a uh, House of Commons Select Committee investigation into land value capture, um, and uh, that's available on the, the Parliament website for anyone interested in reading further on that. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, London's experience in recent years. Like many cities across the globe, it's experienced very significant house price inflation, uh, particularly since the global financial crisis. And there was a period between 2013 and 2016 where we were seeing new build house price inflation of around about 20 to 30 percent per annum and also substantial variation across London with the highest values being broadly in the centre um, and centre west and lower values uh, as you progress out towards uh, outer areas of the capital. We've also had very significant rental price inflation, which is the blue line, uh, much higher than in the rest of England. This graph is an estimate of what's happened to land values up to 2015, and the green line shows how much land values increased, uh, particularly in the period after the global financial crisis as we saw a recovery of the housing market. Uh, but in addition to uh, residential prices increasing and have a, having a bearing on land values, we also had a change to the planning system. We had new national policy was introduced in 2012 called the National Planning Policy Framework. And this introduced for the first time viability testing as a major component within the planning system. And it led to a process in the next few years of affordable housing levels decreasing. And I would argue that that had an impact in terms of inflating land values, the opposite of land value capture. And one particular issue arose where uh, developers were using the price paid for land in viability assessments as a development cost, but that made it inevitable that the affordable housing uh, required through the development plan was found to be unviable as they were reflecting the ability to reduce affordable housing levels in what they were paying for land and basing that on other comparable sites. So that became known as the circularity issue and uh, was ultimately dealt with in a number of uh, appeal and court cases a few years ago. Over this period and up until 2015, we saw a dramatic reduction in the proportion of affordable housing secured through the planning process in London. We also saw a significant reduction in affordable housing grant, which is subsidy provided by government 
to uh, Homes England and the GLA, Greater London Authority in London, to uh, support the delivery of affordable housing. And again, I would argue that the viability system within the planning process had a bearing on that. And now just moving on to the uh, the approach that the mayor has introduced in order to try and tackle this. In 2017, he introduced new guidance and an, an approach that we refer, refer to as the threshold approach. And the way that this works is that developers are asked to provide 35% affordable housing or 50% on public and industrial land. And if they're able to do that, they can follow the fast track route and if that's the case, we don't ask for any detailed viability information. And that means that the schemes get dealt with more quickly and there's greater certainty for the applicants. For schemes that aren't capable of doing that, they follow the viability tested route and applicants are required to submit detailed viability information. The mayor introduced new requirements around transparency of that information because uh, there had been an issue where uh, developers were, weren't prepared for their figures to be produced in the, in the public domain and that meant that it was hard for communities and in some instances even councillors to understand the uh, the reasons why policy compliant levels of affordable housing weren't being brought forward and the guidance also requires that review mechanisms are included in section 106 agreements and these enable planning authorities to look again at viability over the duration of the development to see if affordable housing can be increased if viability is improved over that period. And the guidance also introduced specific, a specific approach to build to rent development, which we've seen grow significantly in London in recent years. So this is just an overview of the threshold approach. So you can see on the left hand side, schemes providing 35% or more 50% on public and industrial land can follow the, viability, uh, the fast track route. Uh, no viability assessment is required. We have one early stage viability review, uh, but on the right hand side for viability tested route schemes, we have multiple viability reviews, including one at the end of the process and during the process, what we call midterm reviews for large, larger phase schemes. And the overall rationale for this was to give greater certainty to the market so that it was properly taking into account affordable housing policies in land values. Um, it provides clear incentives to provide a higher proportion of affordable housing it's helped to speed up the planning process um, and improve transparency so that there's greater confidence in the planning process in London as well. And the threshold approach was reflected in the London plan, which was adopted in 2021. Um, and so that approach now has full statutory weight as it forms part of the development plan. Just a few quick comments in terms of the type of affordable housing which we secure. Broadly, they can be categorised as low cost rent and um, uh, intermediate affordable housing. Low cost rent is for households with the lowest incomes and we have social rent and London affordable rent and intermediate is for middle income households. London living rent is a form of discounted market rent and then shared ownership is a part buy, part rent product. And generally we secure uh, a proportion of both of those types of affordable housing in new developments normally weighted towards low cost rent. So the guidance also provides details in terms of how viability should be tested and we apply a residual land value method approach which takes the projected values uh, which will be achieved in a development. From that, the development costs are deducted. And that includes bill costs, finance costs, professional fees, a profit allowance, etc. And that leaves the residual land value. And that's compared with a benchmark land value. And if the residual land value is higher than the benchmark, the scheme is viable. And if it's lower, uh, then, it, then it's unviable. And the mayor's guidance introduced an approach to benchmark land values, which was based on existing use value rather than the market value approach, which I referred to previously, which was having a, an inflationary impact on land values and reducing affordable housing. 
So just to look briefly at what the impact of that has been in strategic applications in London, generally 150 residential units and above, we've seen a dramatic increase in the proportion of affordable housing, uh, particularly since 2016-17. Uh, and those figures have broadly doubled over that period from the low 20s to the low 40%. And the proportion of schemes following the fast track has increased year on year. Um, and we had more than 60% of schemes following the fast track in 2021. And just to conclude, what's happened to land values? Well, those have dropped quite significantly broadly from around 2016-17. No doubt that is due to wider market conditions and we've seen a substantial reduction in house price inflation in London over the last few years, but also we've had uh, feedback and there are indications that the mayor's approach to affordable housing and, and the political importance given to affordable housing has helped to, uh, to bring land values back down, which reduces costs for developers and means that we're able to secure more affordable housing and developer contributions through the planning system. And the market's responded really well to the threshold approach. There is still much to do. In particular, we need to secure more social rented housing. We have very high affordable uh, housing needs within London, high levels of homelessness, um, high levels of overcrowding as well, uh, but some su substantial progress has been made over the last couple of years. And I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, John. Uh, very, very interesting. Um, just before we pass over to Danny, just a quick reminder that we have the Q&A box just at the bottom of your screens. Um, so if you do have any questions following John's presentation um, or during Danny's, please feel free to pop them into the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, so Danny, I'll hand over to you. Thanks a lot. Um, so I'm just going to introduce this in terms of affordable housing, but I want to expand it a little bit just to understand where we have come from in relation to the notion of affordable housing, housing being linked to mixed tenure and being linked to the notion of counteracting social segregation. Uh, so, I mean, if you, if you look at the, the history of, of um, where this has come from, back in the mid nineties, uh, early nineties, perhaps we'd start to realize, given the level of difficulties we were having with large social housing estates, um, that the development of large scale social housing in the absence of services and social segregation was not a great plan. So the first, I suppose, piece of policy around that was entitled counteracting social segregation. We talked about not doing that, that moved on to a, a, a more proactive approach around social integration, around sustainable communities. And by the time we reached the year 2000, when the economy was booming, we brought together the notion, the need for social and affordable housing and the issue around social integration and sustainable communities, bringing these two issues together in terms of mixed tenure solutions. Uh, and that's gone on to, to the current language around tenure blind estates, compact growth, uh, and more recently in terms of how you do this in the context of a low carbon climate resilient society. And that's all encapsulated in our housing for all strategy, uh, which is now one year old. Generally speaking, when we speak about these issues in planning and housing terms, we talk about active land management. And I'll go on to refer to that. So just in terms of, of the, the planning development act, just to reinforce what I've just said there about the coalescence of, of the social integration issue and the affordable issue. When the Supreme Court was, was considering the current Planning and Development Act, uh, and in terms of reaching a conclusion that it was it was wholly legal to approach it in terms of Part 5, it, it surfaced the two issues around integrated housing development and the need for access to, to affordable housing. It brought those two issues together in terms of of the justification on the planning act, just to, it's interesting to note that the Supreme Court looked at it in that context as well. So um, the legislative provision in this country, uh, as you can see there, is as you, most of you probably know, is that out in the 2000 Act and the accompanying regulations. Um, we had a 20% uh, provision in 2000, where was, which was could be balanced between social and affordable. Most local authorities had 10% social and 10% affordable. 
that obviously I suppose fell away for want of a better expression from 2009 onwards when the construction sector collapsed and really only came back into, was stood down in, in 2011 and came back into focus in 2015 on the Urban Regen and Housing Act, at which point we introduced the notion of transfer of housing on another site rather than the site of the planning application and to another body. So effectively, applicants for permission could satisfy their part five requirement by introducing another site within the local authority jurisdiction or by bringing on board an approved housing body who would be the recipient of the part five housing. It redefined allowable cost and, and uh, it, it reinforced the 10%. We didn't get back to 20% until the Affordable Housing Act of 21. Uh, which is now which is now reintroduced um, the twenty percent and it must be at least 10 percent uh, social and the balance affordable, where affordability issues are proven. That's not countrywide. Um, it also, as is somewhat confused by the uh, transitional exceptions, it doesn't apply to land that already had planning or land that was purchased between the first and ninth fifteen and thirty first seven twenty one. So. For the most part, planning applications right now are not subject to the 20%. Uh, so where it does apply, that the Affordable Housing Act also brought in the, the um, concept of affordable sale, cost rental, and affordable housing. Uh, so, th it's, so that your 10% your affordable can now be cost rental, uh, or it can be affordable for sale, or it can be uh, leasing. So there's, there's a broader option, but Unfortunately, it doesn't have wholesale application. Um, part five compliance, um, you can transfer 20% of the land to the local authority at existing use value. That is proven to be, uh, although the default position in the, in the act, it is proven not to be um, a much used option because the, 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 when you're dealing with complex urban regeneration or urban infill sites, 10% of the land on what's already a very small site for, for high-rise development is not really a viable proposition in terms of transferring land. More amenable to a solution in suburban areas or in, in more rural areas. Uh, but the, So that transfer of land option doesn't ordinarily arise. So the other options are transfer of completed houses on site, transfer of houses off site, as we mentioned, leasing of homes or a combination of the, of the above. Uh, in terms of the determining the value, the definition is there under section 96, just to, if you read the, the last sentence in that slide there, so the costs, including normal construction, development costs, and profit on those costs uh, at open market rates. Um, that definition, given how broad it is, means that particularly in, in the present uh, pricing environment and cost environment where it's inflation is, is a, a significant variable, means that that definition around determination of costs is difficult uh, at the best of times in terms of coming to an agreeable conclusion around what is the real cost at a point in time. Um, just understand where local authorities are at in terms of part five dependency, that's the, the, the um, spy pipeline projected for the Dublin local authorities across the next five years. And as you can see, part five makes up, broadly speaking, 25% of that supply pipeline in terms of social housing, so in terms of where we get our houses from to satisfy our targets, 25% is projected to come from the um, private sector part five requirement. Just in terms of, of the limitations and challenges around part five, so while it's been in place largely since, since 2000, uh, albeit stood down uh, intermittently uh, in the period 2011 to 15, um, the challenges include um, you know, the current transition inclusions. So we have, even though it was, it was brought back in at 20% last year, the transition period means that 20% is not going to apply in very few cases, it's only going to apply in very few cases for the next four or five years. Um, from a state perspective, uh, and given what I've said around dependency uh, on part five, you're dependent on the actions of others in terms of 25% of your social housing pipeline um, is going to is reliant on, on private sector development. Um, so it's linked to buoyancy of the housing construction market, not housing need. Uh, so that's that's that can be a challenge. 
Um, there are too many variable compliance routes in terms of the various options under under part five. Uh, I should I should say these these views are my own, not necessarily anybody else's, but just in terms of 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 our experience on the ground in terms of of developers, stroke builders getting into various arguments around which which of the particular options should be used. I've mentioned previously the open market value and the difficulty in determining that in an inflation period. The cost in Dublin, particularly around apartments, means that the cost of delivered units, um, you know, are much too expensive to meet the affordability threshold of the income of applicants we are dealing with. So it means for the apartments that are handed over, um, in theory, as being affordable, they have to be heavily subsidized by the state to bring them to back to an affordable level. Um, Getting apartment development built at the present moment in time has proven a significant challenge in the viability with the inflationary trends of the last 18 months associated with them. Um, supply chain development post COVID and the geopolitical situation in Ukraine and the resultant inflation environment. The part five alone uh, in its current form is not a predictable or a sustainable solution. That would be my own personal view. Uh, so just moving on from that to, to understand in terms of where else we might get uh, affordable housing from in terms of a broader housing role. So this this comes into this brings us into the realm of active public land and management and the question of local authorities being involved in direct delivery of integrated solutions at scale, joint venture solutions. And we'll also look briefly at the question of, of compact growth. When I mentioned comp compact growth in my opening slide, 40% of all housing development under our national planning framework must be on brownfield sites. And they are quite challenging, and I'll come to that in a moment. Just in terms of the the, um, the local authority approach to active land management, so this slide here takes it shows a, a, a um, rebuilding Ireland was the housing plan for Ireland before the current one, uh, and just to mention that it envisaged the notion of of or the idea of master planned lands uh, developing uh, mixed use tenure developments at scale that has been carried through in housing for all so that's been an active part of housing policy in 2016 the site that you're looking at there is a is a now south dublin county council own site 72 acres that we brought forward in a master planned way having done all the environmental assessments or we de-risked the site and brought it to the market of the joint venture proposition 72 acres the result of that was that we got a partnership approval and planning for 1,100 homes fully integrated um, on, on a 72-acre site, together with substantial investment income, 38 million, in fact, that we could use to invest in further land. So this, this kind of joint venture approach addresses a number of issues. It, it, it addresses the integration issue. Uh, it gives you, it addresses the land availability issue in terms of private developers being unable to access land. It gives relative certainty in terms of the proposition that the joint venture partners getting into with their local authority and it deals with the cash flow problem because presently developers if they want to buy land at scale they cannot get bank approval for funds to purchase land and they will not get bank approval until they have planning permission or, or pre-sales so that the banking environment is quite restrictive in Ireland since the, the, the recession so this approach using public land eliminate some of that uncertainty, de-risks the proposition and deals with the land, avail land availability and cash flow issues. Um, so that's our experience. And just to, to, so if, there, if there's a lesson from that, it works. So this is that development today, a couple of years on, it's, it's about 20% complete. That slide, that slide from the entrance, uh, you probably may or may not think it to look at it, but that slide includes uh, cost rental housing, affordable housing, and social housing in that small slide. And the, the idea of tenure blind, when you look at that, is not immediately obvious where any of those tenure types are. And that's what that's the sort of proposition that I would be putting forward as a main plank of, of um, local government policy and government policy for the, for the delivery of, of, of cost rental and affordable housing at scale as part of a mixed tenure solution, not just relying on part five. The challenge with that is we don't have sufficient land banks right at the moment. That's currently being, being assessed and examined. Um, so um, just to, to, to move on from that, to say that these are just two other examples that we have currently in the pipeline doing that. There's a 600 
if there are 20 house scheme currently at planning application stage would be to be 400 affordable, 100 social and 100 private plus community centre and significant open space. Um, we are also doing as part of a strategic development zone, two and a half, 2,600 homes in six phases. Uh, phases one and two will go to site this year. So for us as a local authority, um, when we look at, look, look at our development plan for the next, for the next six years, about 50% of all housing is either local authority led or local authority sponsored in some way. We have a very active role in public and private housing delivery as a local authority. But to do that, you need to own land at scale. Uh, and that, that right now is a challenge. Uh, so look at, um, that would be, so there was previous presentations as part of this series around land banking. So I would, be a, a strong proponent of land banking at local government level to lead out with joint venture partners on the development of mixed tenure solutions, including affordable housing at scale. That becomes uh, even more challenging when you look at, at um, urban regeneration and brownfield sites. As I said to you, we've, we've got to do 50% to do, uh, um, of our housing on brownfield sites. This is a 700 hectare site. This is currently called the City Edge, and you can look this up yourselves. It's on www.cityedge.ie which is the largest regeneration site in Ireland, perhaps Europe, has currently gone through the first phase of that, which includes, included the development of a framework, uh, a development scenario over the next 50 years, which is likely to accommodate 70 to 80,000 people and 50 to 60,000 jobs. That's very challenging in terms of relocation of industry, in terms of utilities and expanded capacity, energy solutions, contamination issues, overhead cables, transport infrastructure, social infrastructure, to be, to be provided either in advance or hand in glove with developments. So financial and planning support will be necessary uh, to unlock this potential of brownfield sites in Ireland. Um, significant housing and planning gain will arise from that. And we're currently uh, working our way through that in terms of legislative vision. I'll come back in a second. But look, if we were to satisfy the terms of our national planning framework in action on these brownfield sites really isn't an option for us. So it's, it's, it's there, it's up front and centre of our planning policy, but it's a challenge in terms of the level of government intervention that's going to be required. Um, just to mention again, that's just a slide on, on, on the inflation, construction inflation in Ireland since 2015. And you can see what's, what's been happening in the last two years. So that adds to the challenge. Uh, that's apartment developments alone in the last 12 months, about 25,000 in 2022. Um, so apartment construction costs, have gone beyond the affordability of middle income Ireland. So you have a significant inflationary issue. Apartment costs have gone um, to a point where they're they're in part unviable because you don't you can't get, have purchasers. So right now the government uh, is really challenged around the need to deliver housing at scale, the need to develop brownfield sites that for apartments are the logical solution while dealing with affordability. Uh, we also have a situation in Ireland where um, because of viability issues and because of speculative issues, we have uh, in terms of the 73,000 odd units permitted um, on that slide there, 48,000 of them have not been actioned, have not been operationalized. So we have a considerable level of inaction uh, across Dublin in terms of planning permissions not being brought into active use. So where do we go from here? So the, our planning policy um, is the Affordable Housing Act. Uh, we are currently implementing a new residential zone land tax, which uh, we hope will deal with speculative land hoarding. We are in the process of bringing forward an urban development zone bill, which will hopefully um, designate areas as urban development zones, particularly brownfield sites, like I've mentioned, and deal with the challenges around um, that designation and getting the uplift in value, a, a bit like uh, what we talked about, John's talked about there in London, getting the value, the uplift in value from, from the, the rezoning and the redevelopment of those sites. It can go some way towards um, dealing with the cost of infrastructure. On that issue, just to, to, to be aware that in the interim period, we have in the recent past have had a local infrastructure housing activation fund, an urban regeneration development fund, 
We now have an affordable housing fund and we have two temporary measures called Cree Coney and Project Tussie. So across recent government policy in relation to affordability, the issue of subvention has been front and center and it's not going to go away and it's going to become an even, even more critical in terms of brownfield sites. So where next, um, I say affordability is here to stay as an issue. We need to continue on the legislative path in terms of UDZs and RZLT. Part five, I believe, needs greater clarity. And, you know, additional direct intervention by the state through the local government system will be necessary to give a clear policy around land assembly and land pooling. Uh, we need to buy land. If, if, if you look at and you, you, you believe in, as I do, the possibilities around significant uh, developments, mixed tenure developments being promoted by local authorities with private sector partners, and we need to get into purchasing and land and land pooling. Uh, we need to take a longer term perspective in relation to cost rental, um, not just as, as a passing phase, but as something that's going to be here for, for right into, for decades to come uh, because of, of affordability issues. And, and, and in recognizing that, we need to deal with not just the current temporary, um, well, relatively temporary affordability subsidies. We need to deal with that in terms of understanding one scheme that takes us forward for the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much for two very, very interesting presentations. Um, I certainly have, have a lot, uh, lot of questions and a lot more I'd like to find out. But just a reminder um, to our attendees as well of the Q&A box um, that's just on the bottom of your screen. So do feel free. We've a couple of questions in, but if you do feel free to um, to pop your questions um, in there, we'll finish. We're actually finished at 1 p.m. So we, we have a few minutes for questions. All right. Um, so I suppose I have maybe one question for each of you, but obviously if, if the other wants to come in, um, that'd be great as well. So uh, John, maybe just to yourself first, one of the things um, that I, I wasn't aware of before before looking into this um, is that the these viability assessments and all these viability calculations are actually done before the site ever gets planning, um, which is, is very interesting. And, and Daniel, come back to talk more about part five in a minute, but part five is obviously all done after planning when when the uh, the site already has it. Um, I suppose just just in your experience, does that does that is you know how does that whole process work? Um, I suppose a developer doesn't maybe knows they can't get planning and therefore can't add that value to the land until they have either they've used the threshold um, or they've done the negotiations. Um, just a little bit more about that would be uh, I'd find that very interesting. Okay, thanks. So um, we only look at viability for schemes that can't provide the policy compliant level of affordable housing or, or other infrastructure contributions. So it's a way for applicants to submit additional evidence to help them get planning consent and to persuade the local planning authority and the mayor for large applications that uh, they just can't afford to deliver all of the requirements that the development plan is asking of them now. Um, but uh, as I say, we negotiate review mechanisms so that we can look at it later down the line after planning consent is granted if, if things improve. And there may be genuine reasons why some sites can't deliver everything. There may be abnormal site costs. It could be a low value area. It could be that the, the typology involved um, isn't able to sustain the level of affordable housing that we'd normally ask for. But it has been a process that's been fraught with difficulty and controversy. And that's part of the reason why the mayor has introduced this new approach to enable schemes and to incentive incentivize applicants to avoid viability testing, which can be uh, detailed, time consuming, um, controversial, and, you know, has ended up in dispute in, in a number of instances. So, you know, we've got a be better balance now with the majority of sites not going through that process, uh, but that, that route is available for any sites that have genuine difficulties so they can still come forward. And crucially, the Section 106 agreement gets signed on the day that planning consent is issued that forms part of the planning consent. And essentially, it's that uplift in, in land value that, that goes towards the affordable housing, towards the infrastructure contributions. 
if planning consent doesn't get granted because the scheme isn't acceptable in planning terms, there is no uplift whatsoever. So uh, it's a way of, of kind of sharing that uplift in value and making sure that there is benefit for the community um, and that we're delivering sustainable development. And that's you know, crucial for all the reasons I mentioned in terms of affordable housing need, but the need for infrastructure to support the delivery of brownfield sites, um, like Danny was mentioning in, in, uh, in London as well. Very interesting. Uh, Danny, do you want to comment on, on any of that? Yeah, well, look, at the, the, um, there's a couple of things that I find interesting. I, as far as I know, John, and I, I wouldn't profess to be knowledgeable at all about the London scene, but I don't, the, the, there isn't a formal zoning process in London. So the, the, the viability, I, I think the, what's interesting and of, and of value uh, is that so there's two things. First of all, we, even though we address it at planning application stage in terms of part five, we don't address it in absolute terms. So the developer must submit a proposal which is acceptable in terms of the general terms around which they're going to satisfy part five. But the price of the units is not established. Uh, absolutely, the um, there's room for maneuver around whether it ends up being a leasing solution or a cost rental solution or a direct purchase solution. So, in broad terms, they make a submission, which for the local authority satisfies the ten percent, whatever it is, and it satisfies where the units will be. It'll be in block A or block B, and so generally speaking, that's satisfied. But so much is left to be satisfied after, including often very tortuous discussions around which of the elements available, which of the options available to develop will be used to satisfy the power five. And then secondly, the whole question of viability, or well, I can't do that because it's gonna cost me too much and viability. Viability comes in at the end. I think there's a value in viability, A, in eliminating that forever, ever ending, never ending conversation. I get dealing with it up front. And there's also a value in it in my view, in terms of dealing with speculative planning applications, because we do have an issue in this country with speculative planning applications, where um, planning applications are, are, are traded. Um, you might say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's, it's okay, I suppose, at a certain level and, and, and not be able to get planning permission in your land and, and, and sell it on. But where you have significant uh, levels of planning applications not being operationalized, it leaves the whole forward planning uh, and, and forward perspective of demand management and supply management very, very difficult. Because if you're looking at a supply, a potential supply line of 80,000 <clears throat> apartments, struck units, or you want to call them, but really there's 48,000 not been operationalized at this stage, it's, it's so difficult to predict where you're going in terms of, of housing supply. Uh, so I think that if viability testing was, was brought in from the beginning, it would maybe um, leave the planning process a little bit more rigorous. Uh, and I think I would like to see viability testing accompanied by a market uh, demand analysis for the particular types of units in terms of why one bit, why two bit, why three bit. Is it because the development plan says it or because the market is amenable to that solution, or that's what you need in a particular area. So I think better analysis around viability and uh, market demand or local demand in terms of suitability of unit type would, would uh, go some way towards dealing with uh, presumptive or, or, or speculative type application. Yeah, very, very interesting. Um, Danny, just maybe one question for yourself. You talked about active land management. Um, just being, I suppose, is that something that is, as the alternative to part five, as you said, it's it, part five is very market dependent and you're really depending on the private market to deliver the development in the first place and then you get um, whatever percentage you get of that. Do local authorities, I suppose, have the appetite to do that given that it's probably going to involve purchasing more, more land as, as current yeah. land backs and, and I suppose to have the resources or, or could the resources be, be obtained to do that? Well, I think there's a point of principle in planning policy and land management policy in play here. So it's a, a two-part answer. First of all, what I'm advocating, uh, and I have worked in smaller local authorities, uh, is predominantly an issue for, for areas of high demand. Uh, it, sorry, it, in terms of, of land at scale. Um, so <clears throat> so there's, there's, a couple, there's a couple of things. 
I, I would say there, there's, it would be relative to the size and, and population and population projections of, of any area. So uh, in, in smaller, rural, more rural counties, obviously the demand wouldn't be there. You wouldn't purchase land at substantial scale. But if you, if you, um, I suppose, look to, there's, there's things around this. First of all, in 2008, 9, 10, when, when the construction sector collapsed and we built no houses, we can look back at the patterns of what happened from that in terms of social housing demand increasing, in terms of construction collapsing. So there's a value in the government, through local government or through LDA, or I would say both, in having substantial land banking, uh, land pooling in place to deal with downturns of construction, whereby the state can keep construction going. That's one element of it. And the second one is where it can lead and be a leader in proactive lead leading on the the um the development of mixed tenure solutions at scale including affordable solutions and cost rental solutions uh, and not be reliant on the vagaries of the housing construction market or in terms of inflation so so that so you know there's 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 a degree of 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 disquiet um and tension around the idea that public land has been used for private housing uh, and you hear that comes up in conversation and i think that's been misrepresented in some ways because there's there's a, a different view of which maybe can be taken of it or should be taken of it, and that is that local authorities would be substantial owners of land that they would release in tranches to the private sector for they to develop, uh, and 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 that way, that is the very essence of active land management, that the the the, the, the local government system or the government system, in whatever way you look at it, would have. And this is, was part of our previous uh, um, lectures in the series. Would have thousands and thousands of acres of land that it would use to regulate the release of land and regulate the levels of construction necessary, and and that, that would mean looking at it, keeping a cap on it, and to to avoid inflationary trends, and being able to deal with downturns in construction, and being able to deal with affordability. So it's it's a strong personal view of mine, and not, I'm not saying it's not without difficulty. In terms of the cost, in terms of buying the land, obviously, well, I think it's something that that I would certainly personally advocate. Just off the Kenny report again, um, John, do you have? Uh, do you want to come back on on any of that? Yes, just just very quickly to say, in London, um, direct delivery by local authorities has become more significant, and the mayor has a specific fund uh, called Building Council Homes for for Londoners. Um, as well as housing association development as well. And we also see a lot of estate regeneration schemes um, coming forward, um, going back to what Danny was saying about um, developing mixed tenure developments. We always require the affordable housing to be provided on site. And that is an opportunity in estate regen to provide a mixture of market and different affordable tenures as well. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, um, just in terms of Danny's previous point about build outs, there was a review done by Sir Oliver Letwin here, probably about five years ago, um, that he advocated exactly Danny's point about having a mixture of different products to be able to try and bring those to the market and sell them quicker. Um, and the government is, is currently um, interested in tr uh, trying to look at measures to try and ensure quicker build out. And there are some measures in the bill that I mentioned that's going through Parliament at the moment, but it it is a, always an issue. Um, you know, we get applicants seeking planning permission who are landowners that aren't necessarily developers looking for that uplift in land value. Um, and you know, sometimes sites get traded and they get changed over time as well. And you know, developers will respond to the market and they'll they'll build out um, at a rate which enables them to secure the the highest value. So um, you know, th that is the reason for having genuinely affordable housing at the same time, because um, you know, there's only so much control that we have on the market and it's why we need other measures uh, and direct subsidy and direct delivery from the public sector as well. Very good. Um, I'll come back to that issue of subsidy, maybe um, a question for, for both of you in a second, but just before then, there are just two quick questions in on the chat um, for John. So the first is just, um, John, do you have a guide for what proportion of the production cost of housing is accounted for by land in London. So I suppose what what um, maybe percentage or, or figure um, is land cost in, in terms of producing housing? Um, and then just that circularity issue that you mentioned, um, how was that resolved? 
and then I'll come back to the issue of, of subsidies maybe for, for both of you. Great, thanks very much for the questions. So in terms of land costs, we look at this in two different ways. Um, first of all, I mentioned the concept of benchmark land values, which is really a kind of theoretical approach to say, what is the minimum return in a viability assessment that a landowner would need to bring their site forward for development? And I mentioned that we base that largely on existing use value, sometimes with a, a small premium, perhaps as an extra incentive. And uh, if that figure is broadly, um, you know, let's just say around about 10% of development value or more, we know that that's on the high side uh, and that may start affecting viability. It may be that the, the benchmark is being overstated, which can happen quite a bit. And we need to delve into the detail in terms of what that site is, is actually worth in its current value. Uh, we also look at uh, land transactions to get a sense of what the market is really doing. And as a sense check on residual land values. So that's the figure that comes out at the end of the appraisal process that we go through to, to make sure that they're realistic. Um, and we might look at that on the basis of um, land value per, per unit, uh, affordable and market units. And that varies quite substantially across London because of the different values across London. Um, but you know, broadly, it might range from about £10,000 a unit up to about 50000 perhaps higher in, in some um, central areas. Sorry, that's not directly answering your question as a as a factor of production cost, but um, but those are the figures that that come to mind for now. In terms of the circularity issue, um, there was one case in particular in the London Borough of Islington where I worked for a number of years, which I was involved in, um, which went through two public inquiries and then ended up in the High Court. And the approach to circularity was um, the, the main issue uh, at, at stake. The, the High Court judge in the end found uh, that, that that was an approach which was driving down affordable housing levels uh, and he upheld the appeal inspector's decision to refuse planning consent. Um, it's relatively small development, ex-public sector land. It was previously a territorial army site. The proposal was for just over 100 residential units. The developer arguably had overpaid for the site had paid about 13 million pounds, um, had outbid everybody else. But as a result, uh, when they weren't able to bring forward the development at the density that they wanted and had to reduce it, they, instead of reducing uh, the, the land value take, they reduced the affordable housing down to zero at some point. Uh, the, the judge in that case recommended um, that there would be a change to professional guidance and the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors has now updated their guidance to make the approach clearer. National guidance has also been clarified. And so we have now a, a consistent policy framework in which to, uh, to deal with that. And national guidance is very clear that the price paid for land should never be used to inform benchmark land value. So that, that's largely how the approach has been dealt with. That's very, very interesting. Um, Danny, do you want to, to comment on any of that? Um, and then we just have time for probably one more question, so I might come back to the issue of, of subsidies. No, I'm good at that. We'll go on to subsidies if you want. Yeah, um, so I suppose there's a question for both of you, um, because you, I think you, um, I, know, I know, Danny, you had a slide on it in your um, in your presentation, and, and John, you mentioned it just there. Um, I suppose where, and particularly in this environment of construction cost inflation, um, but particularly maybe where the developer uh, where the developer has overpaid for the site, possibly the way to remedy that in Ireland, the approach certainly has been some kind of a subsidy um, is to to just bridge that gap between making it, as you said, truly affordable um, versus kind of theoretically affordable. Um, is subsidies, you mentioned subsidies for intermediate housing there. Is that something that does happen in the UK? And I suppose in what particular circumstances you seem to have managed more maybe without it than we have um what particular circumstances would subsidies um be used and then danny if you wanted to comment on it in the irish context and maybe we should possibly be looking to to use less of them and, and how could we do that thanks so we have a significant affordable homes program which is government funding um, and my colleagues in our housing and land department allocate that to housing associations and to councils to develop affordable housing of, of different tenures, including low cost rent, but also intermediate housing as well. The grant rates uh, differ. Uh, they're generally lower for intermediate housing. 
Um, but you know, we recognise that often that does need some form of, of subsidy to help bring it forward, uh, but alongside development subsidy and the key focus is on additionality and value for money, trying to make sure that the, the grant rates are no higher than they need to be and that we are benefiting from the, the capture of the, the uplift in land value, the very high residential values that already exist. Uh, due to market conditions in London. So some of that development subsidy can go into supporting the affordable housing delivery as well. So when we've secured affordable homes through a Section 106 agreement, they're generally purchased by a, a registered provider, a housing association, sometimes councils as well, and they will pay what they think those units are worth because they have a value because they generate rents, albeit less than the market value. Um, and so um, you know, that that is a... Um, that is a payment made to the developer normally early on in the process. It assists their cash flow and it provides them with certainty and reduces market risk. Um, so you know, it serves its own function and actually can enable delivery. Um, and um, and in, in times of downturn, we sometimes see affordable housing levels increase for that reason. Yeah, really interesting. Um, Danny, do you want to take a minute on, on that there? Business um, I would look at the 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 um the long and the short of it is in Ireland we have been providing in other words subsidy isn't a great word because it conjures up all sorts of of, of images about about um, how the state operates in terms of supporting construction but um, if you look back over 20, 30 years the reality is that at no point were we in a in a space where there was no subsidy so the subsidy either came through mortgage interest relief through mortgage allowances, through tax relief, through things like the service land initiative, through whatever different means, and right up to the to, to, right up right through the Celtic Tiger years, right up to present day. And when we were when we were trying to get back out uh, and building in, in in 15, 16, we introduced the LIHAF scheme, and now we have the Urban uh, Regeneration Fund, and we have on, at least on a short term basis. Project Tusk and Creek Coney here. So a couple of things. First of all, I think the 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 idea of state support in the interest of social and affordable housing, certainly affordable housing, is is um, sorry. I should say as well that if it, it, the, the, those those type of subsidies are complemented by subsidies on the buyer side in terms of help to buy and and what have you. So there's a, there's an amount of money that the state is putting into on both sides of the equation uh, uh, to support. Um, the viability issues to support the mortgage issues. Uh, so on, on either side, that amount of money is in play in terms of how you debate the use of it. Uh, and I don't, and I think that's where it's at. Um, I really appreciate that that the government is 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 trying everything it can, and and which is great in terms of, of trying to get us through the current period of difficulty. But two things. First of all. The need for support, subsidization, whatever I want to call it, is not going to go away because costs are not going to go back to 1970 levels or whatever the place is. And, and um, so, so that needs to be understood. And I think it is. So if, if it's understood, I think look at the amount of money that Ireland Inc. is putting into various supports and see is there one best way forward that gives certainty to all sides, because part of the difficulty over decades has been the construction side, wait, we'll see what the government will do next. What will the government do to help us? Let's wait for the budget. Let's wait for the finance act. Let's wait for whatever uh, to see. And, and that gives rise to uncertainty and gives rise to, to maybe peaks and hollows in construction. So let's see, can we, I think we should see, can we find one way of understanding what the support mechanism is in the interest of affordable housing, because people's incomes are not going to go mad or go through the roof. So there's always going to be an affordable issue. The second thing in terms of how you can afford avoid that, and this is this is a, this is a tried and tested formula in terms of this has been spoken about before by NESC and by ESRI and others. And that's going back to what I said about purchasing land. If you if you if if you have large scale land holdings owned by the state you can absorb those land costs into the, the, the how you tease through your, 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 your 
how you repay for it over 40, 50, 60 years, whatever it is. And you still own the land. You can you can sell on the home on a 100-year, 200-year lease, but the state owns the land and the land isn't charged into the cost. It's recovered, you know, once once the, the initial investment is, is paid for, you can recover your land costs down the line if you wish. Um, so that's a tried and tested approach uh, internationally and it's been spoken about in, in numerous reports. It's not my idea or anything like that, numerous reports in this country. So yeah, if you want to avoid that, you put your, take your money out of, out of, out of subsidization and put it into land purchase and maybe combination of both of those is, is, is something that we, we can get a better balance on. John, I think the certainty, John mentioned it there as well, that, that that's what the threshold um, introduced was just certainty to the to the development sector. And it's just so, so, so important. So like you said, something like that, um, it's it's really key. Um, I think we're just at time now. Um, so unless you either have either of you any final um, remarks that you'd like to make. No, just to thank you very much. Um, very good to see you and, and take part in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, John. Thanks. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, so thanks everybody for attending the, as I mentioned, this is the final, um, this is the final webinar in this series. And um, I just thank all the our speakers for today, John and Danny, um, as well as all the previous speakers, chairs, attendees, supporters um, of this series. The information, um, including the recordings, slides, spread, um, everything on the series is available at the Housing Agency website. That's www.housingagency.ie in the news and events section. You'll also find all of the videos uploaded to our YouTube channel. If you just search Housing Agency on YouTube, you'll find that. Um, if anybody has any issues accessing any of that, just contact training at housingagency.ie. Um, so thanks again, everybody. And thanks to our speakers and attendees. And I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.